All right, welcome to T-Rex Arms live stream. Uh, we are paying attention to the questions on the side, kind of, sort of, but it would be better if you sent questions to the email address, which is trextalk at trex-arms.com. Uh, I realize we've never actually introduced ourselves on any of the live streams, and we haven't put keys up as well, so... Uh, if you already know who we are, then we already know who we are. If you don't, my name is Isaac Botkin. I'm this David. David Botkin. We're brothers. Lucas is also a brother, but Lucas is not here right now. And we're going to be talking about uh, riots and revolution. There is a lot going on in our country right now. It is an extremely complex issue. A bunch of people have been trying to simplify uh, this issue, but not in a helpful way, uh, by essentially boiling it down to just two sides and saying that you have to be on one mm -hmm. of the two sides. Uh, that is not the case. So, uh, David, do you have some, uh, some comments that you wanted to talk about? It is really important that you not let people bully you or manipulate you into taking yeah. the wrong side. And in a situation like the one that we have unfolding in America, there are many different factions, and many of them can be wrong. It's, there's not just the one side right. that's going to be wrong. Right, so I think the, the first thing is we should always, when we start evaluating something like this, uh, we should start with a lot of humility and we should not try to rush to judgment. Yeah. Um, we should wait till we have enough information to try to speak. And one challenge that we face here is this whole situation uh, following the, what I would call the murder of George Floyd. Mm, um, yes. It's been, what? A, it was Memorial Day, what is it, 10 days? I, I don't know. It's been a relatively short amount of time. A lot of stuff has been happening since then, and it's very hard to get a handle on enough data to actually sit down and, and like lay it out definitively. And Especially so, because things keep changing. Yes. New data keeps coming out. Things keep getting redefined, right. and uh, so it is a challenge. So, so a lot of, everyone should approach this with just a lot of... of Humility and patience and waiting as much as possible. Now, sometimes you can't wait. Sometimes there's looters burning stuff down, and there's, there is no time to wait for more facts. Um, sometimes things are sufficiently clear that it, it is time to act. Um, but as I've been watching this whole crisis un unfold and reading forums and reading comments online and stuff like that, um, I've seen a lot of um, the crises, not just in the, in the world. Oh, hey. Wow. Well, that's a new technical problem to add to the list. <laughs> ah, I like the lighting better I, I, now, though, I, I, I do like I do like the lighting better. Do you want to take it down? All right. <laughs> well, we'll just have to do this while it's still daylight. Yeah. All right. So, um, I'm seeing a lot of there's there's two crises unfolding. The first crisis is um, not skylight related. N that would be three. <laughs> the first the uh, first crisis that we're seeing is. Uh, police injustice. Yeah. And the second crisis that we're seeing is non-police injustice. Well, uh, the, the rioting. And then there's a third crisis. And this is the one that I, I think that we're really going to try to address here. And that is the crisis that we see with people like ourselves sitting back and watching this whole thing unfold. And they are trying to make sense out of it. And Isaac has touched on this already. We discussed it some earlier. But they're being forced into this idea, there are two sides and you must choose. There is only support the cops and support the protesters. And they use the term protester as a catch-all term for all forms of protest, whether that's peaceful protesting or whether that is, um, let's shall we say, active, self-activated socialism, you know, looting. Um, very, very peer-to-peer. -peer. Yeah, peer-to-peer yeah. -peer socialism. So both sides are, you know, th th there's these two sides being presented, and we see a lot of people that are conflicted or torn or they don't really know how to analyze this thing. And the answer is sometimes you don't, you don't have all the data, and it's, it's very challenging. And so, um, but what I would say is don't be pressured into jumping onto one of these sides. And as I've been reflecting on everything that's going on, I was reminded of the... Um, the Milgram experiment. Mm. And I'm going to cover this. I'm going to summarize it. You can go read about it more online. It's a very interesting um, thing. This is related. It'll make sense, I think, in a minute. If it doesn't, you can go find another live stream or something. But <laughs> <laughs> um, in, 
After World War II, the question was asked, as more evidence of you know, documentation about the, the Nazi atrocities came out, the question was asked, how on earth could the Germans actually commit so many atrocities? And how, they, how could they kill so many people? Where did they get the necessary number of psychopaths to do this? And so in 1961, an experiment was run by, I think it was a guy named Milgram, to test and find out how many people could be coerced into killing someone. And to summarize it very simply, they, they set it up like it was a scientific study, like, oh, come help us run a study. We're doing a study in um, memory. And we're seeing if electroshocks can be used to improve a person's capacity to remember information, you know. And so they would bring in people off the street, and the person off the street thought they were there to help run the experiment, but, experiment, but actually they were the guinea pigs in the experiment. They were the test subjects, not the guy that they thought they were interacting with. And so what happened was they were, they were brief, they were paid some money, very important, they were paid some money. There was an authority figure to, uh, there, there was the scientist in the lab coat telling them, hey, this is what we're doing. And then they were told, after being paid, you will administer, you will ask a question of a person who you are talking to through an intercom, and then they will answer the question, and if they get it wrong, you will apply a shock, turn up the voltage another notch, and then continue the experiment. And what happened was, the, the question was, how many would actually go all the way through to killing this other person? And they were incredibly shocked when they discovered that 65% of their test subjects would actually go through to administering the final 450 volt shock. And along the way, the actor that was playing the memory subject in the experiment was protesting. He wanted to terminate the experiment. Um, he said he was having health problems. It's very disturbing All, all this other stuff. Yeah. And the, I'll read this. This is from, from Wikipedia. It says, in Milgram's first set of experiments, 65%, 26 of 40, of experiment participants administered the experiment's final massive 450 volt shock and all administered shocks of at least 300 volts. Subjects, those are the, the volunteers off the street, were uncomfortable doing so and displayed varying degrees of tension and stress. These signs included sweating, trembling, stuttering, biting their lips, groaning, and digging their fingernails into their skin, and some were even having nervous laughing fits or seizures. Every participant paused the experiment at least once to question it. Most continued after being assured by the experimenter, the guy in the white lab coat. Um, some said they would refund the money they were paid for participating. So this experiment was done, and people discovered, wow, without that much coercion, you can actually take a person mm -hmm. and force them to kill a person, even while that other person is protesting the violence that they're suffering. As long as there's a person in a white lab coat, there's and an a little expert, bit of, there's a little bit of money. A little bit of money at play. A few things to overcome those yeah. speed bumps or hurdles. Yeah. And this experiment, has been repeated many times since then to say, okay, well, is, okay, maybe they somehow knew it was an experiment. Maybe they somehow knew the person on the other side of the, of the screen that they couldn't see, that they were just talking to, was an actor. Maybe somehow, and so they, they've done double blind variants of this test and, and the results are, are fairly consistent um, when they come back. And what I've always wondered is, what would happen if you had a person that had a really strong ethical understanding of what was right and wrong, and a really strong uh, set of convictions to go with those that he would only do the right thing. Would the percentage of people that would actually kill another person, would that number go down? And the way this all ties in is, well, we can see this with law enforcement. They're told, oh no, these are the laws, and you will enforce these laws. And some of them go and just unthinkingly, you know, enforce those laws. We see the same thing happening with protesters who are being told, oh, this is the way to protest. This is the way to right the wrongs. We're now going to smash other people's property and administer crippling beatdowns to people that have done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then there's people like us who are watching this from a distance to some degree, and we're saying, what do we do? And we're being told, you must pick one of two sides. And the answer is, okay, first off, don't be milgrammed. Don't have pressure applied to you that then forces you to go do something that you that don't it, want to do. That, it, that you don't want to do, and specifically that is abhorrent to your conscience. These people that were, I mean, some people had PTSD like symptoms when this whole experiment was over. It was so traumatic to them to be told, no, push the button and shock the person, turn up the voltage and shock the person, 
who was in the middle of protesting and saying, I have to stop the experiment. My, I'm having a heart problem. And they had trouble coping with that, and yet they did it. So the first, the first thing is don't be milgrimed and don't be forced into a fa false dichotomy. You know, analyze everything individually based on what you know to be right or wrong. And if we apply this very simple standard and we start looking at the facts, we condemn the murder of George Floyd. We say mm -hmm. all Americans should always condemn inappropriate or unlawful uses of force. And similarly, we condemn the looting and the beatings and, and the, that kind of violence because we say all Americans should always condemn inappropriate or unlawful uses of force. Yes. This is what America is based on. This, this premise, this argument is why we are a separate country today and not part yeah. of the British Empire. We started this grand American experiment by resisting unlawful force and yeah. defining why it was unlawful. And we're going to talk about some of the aspects of the American Revolution compared to the French Revolution uh, and keep going over a few of these uh, modern things. But one of the things that I do want to point out is there is a desire to simplify things in a bad way and put everything mm -hmm. into these two buckets. You must pick one of these two sides. Um, and that, obviously, for, for those who want to cause division, that is a super simple tactic. For yes. those that have an agenda that they want to push, that helps them push their agenda. But this is also part of the way that we've talked about uh, a lot of things. We've talked about politics in a very binary two-party system for generations. We've talked about... Um, all sorts of aspects of politics in a very collectivist group mentality. Uh, group identity is a super important thing. And so being able to break down individuals, individual rights and individual wrongs is actually a very important thing when analyzing some of these things. The fact is there are uh, examples of terrible police brutality in the last few days, um, mm -hmm. starting with the people um, who were apprehending George Floyd and killed him. But there have been some really rough things that we've seen in videos from, yes. from different protests. There have been some amazingly uh, problematic looters right. committing acts of injustice against other people that are hard to watch and heartbreaking to watch. But at the same time, there have also been protesters who have been noble, who have been careful, who have put themselves in danger to protect other people. And there have been law enforcement officers who have done the same thing. So the trick is not to count up how many good cops and bad cops and then justify the whole group or to just find a couple examples of one or the other and then condemn that whole group. We have to be able to actually look at what is right and wrong and look at the actions of individuals, um, even though it is important to talk about wider uh, yeah. wider um, trends or laws uh, or um, requirements for different groups. If we're talking about injustice, we can look at individual rights and right. individual wrongs. And, and that was something that is a very important part of the American Revolution. Right. And, and a thing that you find in communist countries, um, Hitler wanted to bring it back, it's the concept of tribal liability. So you have a, a whole tribe, and when someone in the tribe commits a crime, the whole tribe is punished. And this, you know, we completely reject that concept in America. Um, we completely reject that concept as Christians. Uh, the Bible very clearly teaches that a, a man shall not be put to death for the crime of his son. The son shall not be put to death for the crime of his father. You know, each person shall bear, bear his own guilt. And what we see with these riots so often is tribal liability is being applied to all protesters and all cops. And um, there is not this principle of individual judging of a person's actions, whether they be right or wrong. And so you have completely innocent bystanders being beaten horrifically, um, and you have, or pepperballed horrifically. And we see, yeah. there's, there's, as I've been watching this, there's, I mean, my heart breaks at some of the different video I've seen, and I get so frustrated there's some departments that are being really intelligent. They're actually, they're, they're approaching this humbly uh, with a lot of compassion and wisdom. They're joining in the marches. They are protesting what they see to be wrong actions taken. Um, and there's other departments and if they're trying to make the argument that no, we don't have a problem of systemic police brutality in this country, they're doing a really, really bad job of it. Um, 
I mean, this is like, there's books out there. This is a book called Counterinsurgency Warfare by uh, David Galula. There's all kinds of stuff that's been written on this kind of thing. Like when you have a, a dis, you know, dissatisfied or disaffected group that is behaving in a revolutionary way and they're, they're citing injustices, you know, one of the most effective ways to address that and diffuse the situation is to address the injustices. And there's these departments out there that are saying, no, there's no problem with injustice. Here, watch while we crush you under our shield wall. Yeah. And, and like I saw this one video, they had ordered everyone off the streets. Okay, I'm going to say that's probably a valid order. I mean, I'm, I haven't read the details, but, you know, yeah, streets right, are the not right, the place to protest. The right probably. to assemble. Check. And, and uh, I forget the exact wording right now. What's yeah, the first uh, amendment? To, to petition for redress. Petition for redress of grievances. Petition the government for redress of grievances. Yeah. We're all in favor of that. We're 110% with the First Amendment. But my yard, my yard is not your place to come and assemble. That's my yard. <laughs> and similarly, the streets. We all are supposed to have access to the streets, but we don't just have unlimited... I can't turn the road in front of my house into a shooting range. There's limits. Um, might be interesting. Might be fun. It would be nice to have asphalt to shoot on sometimes. It doesn't get muddy. There's no chiggers. But... Um, <laughs> But you have you have uh, right. the, the cops telling the people to clear the streets. Yeah, so you have the cops clearing the streets, and a group of protesters kneels down and forms a little circle, and it looks like they're praying or singing or something, and they're just they're as benign as could be, but they're not leaving the streets. So the shield wall approaches, they get to the people, they pause for just a moment, and then bash, 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 bash with the shields, and they crush them down into the pavement. And it's like, guys, you do realize that you are not making the point that there's not a problem with police brutality. Those guys that you just beat up just won. They just won. That little engagement, they won the ideological point. So if, even if there was nothing wrong with what they did, even if those, those protesters totally deserved the violence that they received, it was stupid and wrong in another sense because it, it proved their point. Mm -hmm. They won yeah. that little ideological engagement, that little propaganda or PR engagement. And I want to talk about another point, though, because... This point about perception is very important. This right. point about what you're actually trying to accomplish with with your... Um, I mean, this is ideological warfare, even though at times it looks like actual warfare. I want to make a, a point, though. As bad as, as police brutality is, as bad as, as bad as excessive force is, I think that a lot of times people are, are missing the point about how bad police injustice really is. Because the worst part of it is not so much that some people got hurt. That's mm -hmm. terrible. Those individual victims have been harmed and just injustice has been done to them. But the injustice does have, this is one thing that I was sort of going to earlier, does have a larger group effect. When you take police officers and you give them bad laws to uphold, mm -hmm. or when they have good laws to uphold, but they are corrupt and they don't, they don't do that, and they do injustice, that actually becomes hugely problematic to the entire society. It actually damages right. the law and order of the entire society. And especially, this is especially important because it is law enforcement's job to enforce the law that governs law enforcement as well. And mm -hmm. I know that some people believe that's just impossible. There's no possible way that the watchman can watch the watchman. But this is part of the reason that we have multiple jurisdictions within our state, uh, the way that the yeah. United States is set up, so that you do actually have multiple levels uh, of authority and jurisdiction, and you have checks and you have balances. But the people who have, have to stop infringements and injustice are the law enforcement. And so when law enforcement gets out of control and is being told not to do this, mm -hmm. the great damage that is being done is to justice as a whole and to the nation as a whole. And that's not to... And that's not to undermine um, the serious charges of murder or the serious charges of, of, of harming people unjustly, but there is a greater problem. And that's something that we see in the French Revolution and at the beginning of the American mm -hmm. Revolution. These are major, major issues that needed to be dealt with. And the American revolutionaries, the American colonists who fought for their independence, did a better job of addressing those wrongs um, than the French revolutionaries did. And that is something that uh, I'd like to talk about. I see a ton of people in the chat. The chat is pretty spicy right now. Apparently we are peak fence sitting because uh, on opposite <laughs> sides uh, is wrong. And the fact that we are seeing wrong on both sides make us fence well, sitters, that's uh, interesting. Is well, I mean, most of the, most normally, of here. <laughs> normally I say, if you're middle of the road, you're just gonna get run over. 
Yeah. Right? So normally we're totally opposed to... I wouldn't say this is but, middle of the road, though. I would no, say out I of the 150 different positions out there, this well, one is on a different road than a lot of people are on right well, now. Well, it's like, let's say you live in Poland in the 19, early 1940s and you're being cho forced to choose between Stalin or Hitler. The correct solution is neither. I mean, terrible timing to live there, but I mean, the correct solution is not, the correct answer is not, well, which is the lesser two evils or whatever. I mean, they're both atrocious and they're both killing tons of your people. There is not a, you know, there, the correct solution is a quote unquote middle of the road solution in that sense because you can't go and support this one or the out one. You know, neither genocidal maniac is the appropriate side to support. Yes. And so, and in this case, we do not support the, there are cops. So we used to do volunteer fire stuff, mm -hmm. right? And this resulted in us having a good amount of interaction with law enforcement. And there's traditionally been kind of a pseudo-friendly rivalry between cops and firefighters. Yes. And firefighters and EMTs. It's entirely friendly when it's entirely friendly. Uh, in, some depart in some jurisdictions, it's not very friendly. <laughs> like the, the firefighters get arrested by the cops and stuff like that. And it yes. gets kind of spicy. Uh, where we were, it was, it was very friendly, um, I would say. And we met cops... I would say this 110%. I met guys and they were awesome because they were 110% committed to protecting the rights of the innocent. Mm -hmm. In one case, um, innocent people who were dead and they spent hours and hours and hours doing the work to collect the evidence so that they could go to court later and see that justice was truly done. And the respect and consideration I saw from those men towards um, the deceased, um, it sticks with me to this day. But by the same token, I also saw officers, this one also sticks with me to this day. We were on the highway and we were closing it down and I was with this other officer and we were chatting and he popped his trunk and we were getting traffic cones out and setting them up and shutting it down because I think a helicopter was coming in or something. And, and I saw a rifle case in his car and I was like, oh, is that one of those M16s that you guys are issued? You know, they was, these were the um, Vietnam War era M16s. And he's like, oh, no, that's just my shotgun. I, it was too much trouble to qualify with the M16. And, I, uh, and a, par, yeah. a little part of me just died and like, you were given free ammo to go shoot an incredible historic firearm that's also the far better weapon than anything else you had in your car. <laughs> and it was too much trouble. Like there's, we, we've seen both sides. And, 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 and again, yeah. <laughs> All of, the, all of the people that are involved in what's going on are individuals. And it is very problematic <clears throat> to just throw individuals into groups and do the tribe justice thing that Hitler right. wanted to do, that collectivists yeah. have always wanted to do. But they are part of a system. We're all part of a system that is very broken. And there's a lot of people uh, in the comments right now. There's a bunch of people on social media. I have a lot of conversation with people who point out that the system is broken and therefore the entire system should be destroyed. There's an argument to be made for that. And then there's people that make <laughs> the argument that because the entire system is broken, there should never be any system, period. To straight anarchy. There's not a good argument to be made for that. We'll get to that later. They but can move to Somalia if they want. There are places where actual anarchism is being tried as we speak. <clears throat> Um, but one of the things that I think that is important to talk about is, yes, we are part of a broken system. But if you've traveled internationally, um, you've probably seen that we actually have a system that is in many ways less broken than a lot of other countries mm -hmm. have. There are parts of our system that are not broken. And in the same way that we don't want to throw all people in the same bucket as all other people that have some criteria that we've picked so that we can blame them all with you know, land them all with exactly the same sins as the worst person in that bucket. We also don't want to do that with the entire system that we're a part of. There are parts of our system that are really important and they, they have, they're no longer being applied, like the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is a really important part of our system that is still good and it still is a very important part of the system. It's just heavily infringed upon by a bunch of additional laws. So let's look at some of the underlying stuff that, um, our founders had in mind when they began to um, when they began to resist the tyranny of the British Crown and they began to resist the police brutality uh, of the Redcoats. 
Um, right. There's a couple of events that people will bring up as it relates to what is going on right now. Uh, one of them is the Boston Massacre. One of them is the Boston Tea Party. Mm -hmm. uh, have you checked on Boston recently? Is uh, What's happening in Boston right now? now uh, I, I, think I, of don't, it? I don't know. That'd be I really haven't actually heard any news from Boston uh, regarding this. But the Boston Massacre is a very interesting point because it happened uh, before the Declaration of Independence. It happened well before. before the war actually kicked off. But before the war actually kicked off was a huge amount of legal protestation um, from the colonies mm -hmm. saying what's, how we're being treated is wrong. The taxes that we are being given are, are wrong. The way that your soldiers are enforcing the laws are wrong and the laws that you're trying to bring to bear on us are wrong. You need to address these grievances that we have. Uh, this had been going on for some time and um, you can probably remember more of the details of the story, but well, the, the mobs of angry people surrounding uh, a soldier's readout yeah, well, near Boston so, Harbor. So yeah, it was near Boston Harbor and there was, um, there was just this little guard post and for some reason, there was, they were just, as far as I'm aware, they didn't go anywhere or do anything. They were just there at their post and for some reason an altercation started up and the It a became mob, a riot. A little riot mob thing started pelting them with rocks and bits of shells and, um, um, daring them to shoot, and then at some point, they actually were closing in on the soldiers, and the soldiers did shoot, and a number of the uh, colonists died, and it, it went to trial, and uh, John Adams actually, who's one of our founding fathers, he actually represented the soldiers, and he argued that their post was like their home or their castle, and they had a right to be there in that case, and they had a right to defend themselves when they were unjustly attacked, mm -hmm. and his arguments won the day, and so those soldiers were actually spared uh, a death sentence as a result uh, because they were found to have acted, broadly speaking, in the right. Um, that would be, we were discussing this earlier, like this would be similar to, you know, maybe the soldiers shouldn't have been there in the first place. Right, and this was something that, this is something that John Adams had been saying from the beginning. The soldiers should not be here. Right. British soldiers should not be here. But since the British soldiers are here, this event happened and the British soldiers were not actually in the wrong. And while he got a lot of heat from people mm -hmm. for defending the enemy, this was actually the right thing to do. And it showed yeah. a level of moral consistency that in the long run was extremely helpful for the movement, for the people that saw it in America, who saw a standard that they should adhere to, but mm -hmm. also for people in other countries who realized yeah. that America was going to do this properly. Well, and in Europe. I mean, it, it was, was very important that we have some allies in Europe for sure. And it was very important that there were people in England who had a better understanding of what the colonies were actually trying to do. Right. And um, doing things properly uh, is very important. Now, this is why right. we, we're, where we bring up our standard. Uh, by what standard are you doing things properly? By right. what standard are, are you right and are you just? And even though the, the standard that they were living by, and it, this is another thing that, that people get wrong, is the whole point of the American Revolution was not to just get rid of kings. Right. They just had enough of monarchy and so they're getting rid of kings. Right. The issue was that the colonies were founded by a contract with the crown. And over the years, the crown had been getting out of hand, not, a, not upholding its end of the contract, and had yeah. been allowing uh, parliament to boss uh, the colonies around. Yes. That's what no taxation without representation means. It would be kind of like if the state of Kentucky started passing taxes against Tennessee. It's like they, it, they, they, they have no jurisdiction over right. us. Our relationship with the United States is to the federal government as a state. Kentucky no. is not over us except geographically. They're our hat. And, and, so, and, and, only, and only if you're one of those northern supremacists. <laughs> oh, there's northern supremacists, true. Um, so, so one of the things that is really important to realize is the way that they pled their case mm -hmm. uh, on the world stage, but also in terms of communicating their message to people was the king had an agreement with the colonies. Mm -hmm. The king has broken the agreement. The king mm -hmm. has unkinged himself. We're gonna keep upholding our end of the bargain. We're gonna keep living by the law. We're gonna keep doing things properly, but the king is no longer in charge of the colonies because of the way that he has broken this right. agreement. And when, after they won the war, when they actually uh, drafted the constitution, they put those kind of express limits mm -hmm. 
This is a, the Constitution is a document that gives very limited power to the federal government, and at any point, the states are able to go to the federal government and say, hey, these are the limits that you're supposed to be in, and by getting outside of these limits, by violating this document, you have unkinged yourself. Now, right. we're a long way from having the uh, ability to do that in a, in a peaceful way, apparently, but that yeah. is the sort of thing that that document is supposed to allow. That is the sort of thing that our founders really wanted to accomplish. So, so we see this, I think, super clearly, that they were, the founders were seeking very hard all along the way to do the right thing at every step. Mm -hmm. And it caused them to do things almost always correctly. And by contrast, then when we see people do things conspicuously incorrectly, and then you know, we can see the effects of that, and we, like, we can really see the contrast. So if we go back to the, um, the Boston Tea Party, there's all these people supporting the idea of these riots and looting with the Boston Tea Party, because clearly it's the same thing. A bunch of people didn't like what was going on, so they went and they destroyed a bunch of property. And, and um, do you want to say anything about that? Sorry, I was reading questions. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to say anything about the Boston Tea Party? Well, the, the Boston Tea Party is something that also comes up because it is painted by our uh, random internet people as being identical to the looting and the rioting. Yeah. Now, in the first, there's, there's two points that I want, want to make. One is, no, it, it was not the same. The right. Boston Tea Party people tried very, very carefully to not be looters, to not... Uh, yeah. be riotous. They very carefully went into the ships, they picked up the tea and they threw it overboard. They didn't keep any, they didn't hurt the ships in any way. They did yeah. break a padlock and they came back the next day not wearing masks um, to pay for the padlock and explain that they were very sorry that it happened. So it was well, handled in a completely different way than the riots and the looting that are happening now. The second point I want to well, make the, though is I'm not sure that that was actually okay for them to destroy that tea. Right. So the, it's an but they were super careful. And it was, it was a really challenging situation. So privately owned ships sailed into the harbor and the king said, the colony has to pay the tax on the tea when the tea is unloaded. And then they also said, oh, and you cannot leave the harbor with the tea still in your hold. So these captains whose business was um, making money by carting stuff around, their ships were suddenly held hostage because Boston would not allow the cargo to be unloaded. The king would not let them leave. It was kind of not unlike when the businesses were shut down because of coronavirus. You know, mm. the, 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 the government just put a kibosh on their ability to do that thing they do in order to make money and feed their families. And so... And that's an authority that they technically did not have. And so suddenly they're in this really weird conundrum. And so, as I understand it, the ship owners wanted someone to take care of their tea problem. And the... Someone to take care of their tyranny problem. Right, in this case, and free them from this, this horrible burden and this horrible conundrum they were placed in. And so some people decided that they would dress up like savages. And I haven't researched this, but this was about the same time that the militia movement was picking up in America. Yes. And the Crown was insistently saying, you must abolish your militias. And the colonists were very cleverly, maybe largely accurately saying, oh, well, we need these militias to protect us from the Indians. So maybe there was something else going on when they all dressed up as Indians. Um, uh, there were I'm not a, sure. There were a bunch of layers of uh, symbolism it's, when they did that. It's but a it's... giant onion. So, so, so the people show up to protest. And it's not, they're just, we've decided we don't like tea and we're going to go destroy tea. There's a lot more going on here. So they go onto the ships in a very orderly fashion. They collect the tea. They throw it overboard. Any property that got damaged was, was repaired later. And apparently they actually frisked when, when it was all over and done, as the protesters, or whatever you want to call them, left the ship, they patted them down to make sure that they didn't have any tea on them. And they actually found one guy with tea on him, and he got thrown over the side into the water. Um, so they did not want to be privately um, benefit from this in any way. They wanted to make sure that they were keeping the main thing the main thing. Right. And, and not this is giving the other side an argument like, oh, right. these were actually just looters. They actually did not have any, they weren't really concerned about the main principle. They were actually just wanting to enrich themselves. And that's kind of what's happened. Like there's a very legit point that's being made. And the protester side today has their credibility seriously marred with a whole bunch of people. Because Which is terrible because there are tremendously horrific wrongs that should be protested. And there are people that are trying to protest them properly. But then there are also these 
distractions. There and, are also injustices that are being done. And I'd be, I'm just really personally curious to know, is it 1%? Is it 10%? What is the percent of people that are actually steering in other, in other directions? And, and is it for purposes of, well, I just want to do a little socialism for myself. Is it that? Or are they Antifa types maybe that are actually trying to, to instigate a civil war? I don't know. I mean, and there's, there's we, always, we know that those people exist. We there's just always going to be a lot of different... Yeah, agent provocateur types who are messing yeah. in, in politics that have an agenda. And I think it's pretty obvious to see that the media has an agenda. Two weeks ago, the media was talking about people who were peacefully protesting the lockdowns, asking that the government, please, please, please let them reopen their businesses. And those people were condemned as being violent. And the media just hyperventilated over them. They were and terrified just, they couldn't of believe the damage it. that it could cause. Um, but now that we have looting going on, the media is spending all their time praising uh, the looters, really, and spending very little time talking to the actual protesters, the people that have something to protest and are right. describing how justice could be done now that injustice has happened. Right. It's hugely problematic that that's what's happening. And by the way, um, I want to talk about um, what? this this... The way that you change government is super hard. Right, and I want to have one more thing about the American Revolution in, uh, one more point about what they did right, because it ties into your yeah. point. So and, there's, and I'd like to just real quickly say, there's not a whole lot of people that do this right. The American revolutionaries, the reason we keep bringing them up is not because we're Americans. There's very few people that have done this as well as the American colonists. Right. That's why we keep bringing them yeah. up. Yeah, so we see, we see the change needs to happen, and they did it in a way that worked. Yeah. A lot of people have done it in ways that didn't. So when the Boston Massacre happened, the court system, and you know the British soldiers, defended by an American attorney, ultimately came up with the right answer, which was that the redcoats were in the right. When the Boston uh, Tea Party happened, they were trying so hard to do this thing the right way to address the issues of. The ship, the ship owners and everything else all in one fell swoop. And when we come forward then to 1775, um, even late 74, and we start to see the British moving in this, you know, more and more troops are coming in and they're actually moving in the direction of confiscating powder and there's these powder alarms around the country, uh, around the colonies. They're, and then, they're stationing people in houses. And then we, we, we come up on April 19th when it does finally kick off. Um, it's so interesting when you read through all the militia had really had it grilled into them, um, or they'd all discussed it and they concluded this was the right course of action or whatever, but, but they were all super consistent, we will not fire the first shot. Mm -hmm. These were not hotheads seeking a fight. These were not you know, people going to prove that they're better or whatever fighters than the Redcoats. And so in two separate incidents, you have the Redcoats... Um, you know, Lexington Green, it's still debated. No one really knows who fired first. It was probably an accidental discharge that went first. But then the Redcoats did volley on the, the dispersing militia. But then at Concord Bridge, the Redcoats, they totally opened fire first yeah. and killed, I want to say it was three militiamen right then and there. And then that's when the militia gave the order and they returned fire. And that's what really kicked the war off. And after that was all done and the battle was over, the colonial leaders sent out um, notaries to get witness statements from people like, this is what happened here, this is what happened here. And they collected up all these statements and they put it on the fastest ship they could find and they sent it to London. And the British government in Massachusetts, they also put together a report and they sent it. But the American report got to London like three weeks ahead of the official British report of what happened. So for three weeks, the British government in London was reading the American account, which detailed how they had been fired on first, how their rights were being trampled, how they had tried so hard to do everything right, and it swayed the British Parliament significantly, so that when the British you know, government really fully went to war, there were a lot of people in Parliament that were not on board with the King's position. They were on actually on the side of the colonists. Um, interestingly, in that whole thing, there was at least one thing that was done conspicuously wrong. And that was one of the militiamen at the bridge um, came on an injured red coat and he hatcheted him in the head. And yeah. um, that got turned into the militia are scalping uh, red coats. And then that got turned into atrocities committed by the red coats. And it went on and on and on and on. And the point is when you do everything conspicuously right, you try as hard as you can to only do the right thing, 
generally good fruit is born out of that. Yeah. But just one little wrong can get spun all out of control. And right now in our country, we don't have one little wrong. We've got a whole bunch of yes, little and big wrongs. We have a huge amount of problems that we need to try to fix, but we do need to go about them in the right way. So one of the things that's yep. very interesting to see is um, if you compare two different uh, things, like the French Revolution and the American Revolution, you can see some differences. One resulted in a country that maintained its freedom for a long time. And I want to make the case that we had a not perfect, but pretty good system that uh, our founders put into place. Are things way uh, more tyrannical now than they should be? Absolutely. That has happened over time. That has been really problematic to see, but it doesn't mean that our founders failed in a deeply fundamental way, the way that say the French revolutionaries failed. Um, we're, we're sort of short on time actually. We've spent a lot of time talking about the, the Americans um, one of the things that is also interesting to study is some of the more recent um, unorganized uh, uh, ad hoc revolutions. So if you, if you look at successful positive government change through uh, revolutionary action, um, I would say that America is probably the most, um, the most righteous and also the most fruitful. English Civil War, um, they worked very hard to do things right, but it was a, a much more temporary uh, but a positive change. And then you see things that are much more, the change was not great. They started out in a not great place in um, Tsarist Russia, for example, but things were undeniably far worse after the Russian Revolution. Um, things were far worse after the French Revolution. Things got really bad after the Chinese Cultural Revolution. And then when you have uh, a much more disorganized group of people, you get things like the situation in Cambodia, um, the transition from Rhodesia to Zimbabwe. Uh, Somalia is a good example of what happens when you're not actually building towards, uh, you're not building a civilization, you're just tearing down a broken system and hoping that something better comes along. Um, there's a difference between revolutionaries who are trying to build a superior system and people who are just hoping that out of the ashes something will magically come. And that's when you get things uh, like Zimbabwe, Somalia, Libya, and Cambodia. Um, so that is something that I think that we should all be looking at in our history. And for those of you that see major, major problems with the United States, you're not wrong. You're, you are seeing those things correctly. You are seeing terrible injustices that are being done on a daily basis. You are seeing tremendously problematic laws that we have on the books right now that need to be addressed. Right. But it's, I think that one problem we have is people, um, they look at the wrong thing and they say, that's the problem. And they see mm, police yes. brutality or whatever. And they say, that's the problem. Like, well, yeah, there's, there's some real problems there. But systemically, if we back up and we look at it, um, when I've studied it and I've thought about it, I've concluded I think law enforcement is responsible for maybe 10 or 15% of the overall problem. Um, I think the courts are probably 30 or 40% of the problem, uh, something like that. And then um, the government passing laws, the legislature, they're the rest of the problem. And I would like to point out, although no one's going to like this observation, uh, we the people are the ones who have voted in a lot of these politicians. Yeah. We've asked them to make laws that do things like fight a war on drugs because we don't want to deal with that problem ourselves. And then we complain that the war on drugs created a lot of bad laws and forcing the cops to enforce those bad laws created a lot of bad cops. We asked the government to educate our children because we didn't want to do it ourselves. And then we complain that the government isn't doing a good enough job and our, our kids no longer need the things that they, they no longer know the things that they need to know in order to continue to build this country in a positive direction and yeah, we the people have really passed the buck passed the buck <laughs> on to the government and made it bigger and more powerful than it should have been we right. overstepped a lot of the bounds that the founders put in place and walking that back is going to be a problem really hard but it is something that we we have to try to do and yeah. burning the whole thing down and hoping that it's just magically better at the end of the bonfire is not the solution right i mean as a business owner if someone came to me and said, oh, you have problems in your business? And they answer, like, of course we do. Every business has problems that we're trying to solve. <laughs> I mean, um, and they said, I, we have just a solution for you. And they detailed a solution. You know, I would want to see some, some uh, track record to go with that sales pitch. But what we're seeing with Antifa and, the, and those types of protesters is 
they say, look, the system has problems. Burn it all down and we will fix it. And they're not pro providing any real roadmap to what they would consider to be a solution. And they certainly have no um, evidence that they can actually manage their way out of a shoebox. You know, actually, shoes are kind of an interesting example. I was thinking about, like, let's say I had a pair of shoes, and they were the only pair of shoes I had, but they had holes in them. Like, yes, they have holes in them. But if someone came along with a shoebox and said, I would like to give you these shoes, just burn your shoes first. The answer would be like, no, I'm not going to burn my shoes until I know what is in that box. Maybe they're children's shoes. Yeah. How do I know they'll work? And that's kind of, there's people saying, let's just burn it all down and start from scratch, is basically what it sounds like they're saying. Yeah. And they're not proposing anything remotely like a solution. And they're not even accurately, in some cases, identifying the problem. Like, right. abolish it, all the police or disarm all the police or something. Like, these are uh, a stab at a solution but maybe it's not taking into account the totality of the problem. I mean, the, the, the reality is, so I used to be, um, there should be no police. That was, you know, way back in the day. I was very naive and I was like, everyone should have guns and then you wouldn't need police. Um, but I did what I hope everyone does, um, or I tried to anyway, and that is research the topic. So rather than just spout off my opinions, I, I try to read about them first and get educated. And as I read, I came to the conclusion, whoa, there's a lot of crimes out there. and they're crimes that can't be solved just by no. shooting somebody. No, like if someone embezzles from my company, or like, here's a problem we have, um, fraud, you know, credit card fraud, you know, stolen credit card is used and we ship goods to the fraudster and then we discover the card number was stolen and I can't go across the country and shoot that person. That my would gun, not be justice. My gun does not stop him from committing that crime against me. Um, yeah. There's all kinds of crimes, or like that, that I, I, I mentioned it earlier, a horrible wreck occurs someone did something really negligent and now people are dead as a result. This needs to go through the court system to be resolved, but passing motorists are not going to do a good job of shutting everything down, cataloging all the evidence, and then preserving the chain of custody on that evidence to make sure nothing ever gets displaced or you know, called into question in any way that might jeopardize that case as it goes through the legal system. There is a reason to have people that do technically know what they, they're doing, like detectives, um, and I believe in some countries, I haven't followed this up, but I believe in some countries their police force is mostly a detective force. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not a patrolling force like, like you know, road cops and stuff that we have heavily here. Well, that generates a lot of revenue, so they should probably start doing that in those countries. Yeah, they're missing out on it. I mean, and, and we have this, like, there's these people throw b accusations broadly around the country, like, oh, cops do this, or the crisis looks like this, or, you know, whatever. And uh, this is just a broad issue. People should be specific and say, you know, the answer is, the statement, co all cops are doing this, all cops are policing for revenue, is not an accurate statement. But there are totally jurisdictions where they are, rev you know, pro uh, policing for profit. They are, like, red light cameras. Yes. You know, it's proven you lower the yellow light time by half a second and you increase revenue by this much. And people do that. And you increase accidents by a similar percentage. And there are jurisdictions that are presented these numbers and choose to shorten their yellow lights. They are entirely doing that for the revenue. There are cases, there's not too many of them, but you can find them, of police chiefs sending out letters telling their cops like, hey guys, we can't put in any um, quotas, but the number of arrests and fines and stuff do contribute to your bonuses. Yes. We will evaluate this at the end of the year. I mean, this does happen, but you can't say it happens everywhere. You know, there's different this... departments, some good, some bad, some sheriffs are good, some sheriffs are despicable. But I would say that we even yeah. need to go deeper than that and look at what is actually right and wrong and pick, find a standard that we want yeah. to build our country on and not just look for evidence of wrongdoing, even if there's a state that has incredibly corrupt cops. And I could name some states with some very high levels of or corruption. Cities. Yeah. Or cities with extremely yeah. high levels of corruption. The answer is not just to completely be devoid of any form of structure or any form of justice in that particular city because they've tried a system, a broken system, and it didn't work. There's a whole bunch of people in the comments that are yelling at us for being bootlickers. That's pretty normal. Saying that we are uh, taking the easy way out. Look, we understand that this is an unpopular opinion. Uh, I know that there are a bunch of people right here that want us to say that now is the time. Now is the time for us to just put on all of our boo-boo gear and go shoot anybody that disagrees with us. But that is not something that we're going to say. That would actually be the easy way out, probably. 
the most important thing that, that we could leave you with right now is that you have to actually know what is right and what is wrong, and you actually need to keep your emotions in check and do what is right in these situations. If you know your history, you'll actually have a better idea of what is going on and a better idea of what it is that we should be trying to do um, to make our country a better place. Uh, I hope that that's something that everybody that's watching actually wants to do. Not just see what is happening that is unpleasant and use it as an opportunity to attack our enemies. That's what the media is doing. The media is really exacerbating all of these things because they are so incredibly focused uh, <laughs> on the presidential election. It's all that they can think about and everything right. has to be brought back to Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Well, not Joe Biden, but Donald Trump as much as possible. <laughs> and hopefully we forget that it's Joe Biden that's the other guy on the ticket because it's just unpleasant to think about no matter what side of the aisle that you're on. And one of the things that I think is really important is that a lot of the criticism that we have, have been doling out to people who are oversimplifying this issue and ignoring actual justice, we're not talking about the left. We're not talking about CNN. We're not talking about the uh, Antifa extremists who are being wicked and evil. We're actually talking about a lot of guys on our own side. We're actually talking about ourselves. My desire when I see injustice uh, happening, like to George Floyd, or to business owners who are having their livelihoods burned down in front of their eyes and their families beaten with two by fours. Or shut down by the government. Or shut down by the government. All of these things want me to pursue justice and see pain given to the people that cause the injustice. Uh, and this is exactly how the French revolutionaries that we never got around to talking about, this is exactly how uh, Robespierre saw the world. The whole goal of government in his eyes was giving punishment to the people who cause difficulties for society because that is what causes happiness. Um, he actually says this very, very explicitly. It's kind of an amazing definition at the early part of his career. At the later part of uh, his career, he talked a lot about how terror is virtue in and of itself, which is pretty fun. The guillotine. The guillotine! <laughs> Madame Le Guillotine will solve all the problems. That appeals to us because when we see injustice, when we see members of our group getting lied about, members of our group getting pummeled, members of our group um, experiencing pain, we want to see pain given to the other side. But we actually have to check ourselves and really try to come down to what is right, what is righteous, that that is being done here. What is wrong and what would justice be? And what is righteousness and what should we do? Uh, I know that a bunch of folks have been planning to go out mm -hmm. and hang out with people um, on the streets, get all of their equipment, get out there and protect whoever is on their side. I want you to be very, very careful that you make sure that the people that you are protecting are on the right side. Um, I want you to be very, very careful for those of you who are planning to do this that you be extremely cautious and you go to places where you are part of the community and you know the people. Don't just go put yourself in a situation where you don't know yeah. who you are with. Don't go crash the party in some remote location with no local contacts or anything. I mean, yeah. if nothing else, pick a business out of the phone book that looks good and call them up and say, hey, here's who I am. Do you need help? Would you like my help? You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not asking for anything. I'm just, I want to do something because you don't want to show up and say, hey, I'm gonna guard your store for you and then have those people calling the cops on you and like that's... It could get out of control really fast. Ideally, so like here in rural Tennessee, you know, I don't think Antifa will ever show up unless they have like regular infantry companies and this is like a full-blown civil war or something and that's kind of a... I'm not predicting that as a, as a outcome, but like they're never gonna come here. So if I actually wanted to help someone, I would need to go to where the riots are happening and I would need to link up in some meaningful way with someone that's there ahead of time and do my due diligence. Um, we see people, uh, there's a lot of people that oppose like the NFA and the National Firearms Act and they're saying, I don't, I'm a free man, I'm gonna do whatever I want. It's like, okay. This, this, is, this but is, then, is a bad law, the law should be repealed. Of course, but if you show up with your illegal SBR or whatever to do protesting, and you're probably gonna have interactions with the cops, you should not be surprised if they then wanna bust you for your illegal gun. Prudence would say the better part of valor in this case is to take scrupulously legal gear and scrupulously follow the laws such as they are in order to preserve the larger principles. Like I'm going to 
leave my, like, I legally possess um, silencers, but I would, if I was going in there uh, to do stuff, I would probably leave that at home and just take a simple 16 inch AR-15 rifle. Um, so there's really no questions about the legalities of what's going on. There's no reason for them to detain me while they investigate. Because, like I said, the, the, there are abuses that occur. I don't want to put myself in the way of receiving those abuses on myself just to prove a point when I'm trying to do something else. Because that business owner is not well served if I end up in cuffs for a day while his business gets burned down. Yeah. So, so this is a very important principle that... We, we really try to uphold righteousness. There are so many people right now who are protesting injustice righteously, and they really don't get a lot of attention because there are some other people out there who are protesting unrighteousness with more unrighteousness. Uh, and this is happening on both sides of the aisle. This is happening um, for so many different reasons, and that tends to get the most attention, but it also is the thing that is the most ineffective. That's actually not going to cause justice to happen. And justice is something that, that we need to pursue. Not just social justice, group justice, collective justice, but, but individual justice for actual crimes that have happened to individuals. Real people who are made in the image of God, uh, like George Floyd. Real individuals who are made in the image of God, like some of the police officers who have been shot recently. This is something that we cannot lose sight of as we discuss these things. And don't let yourself be milgrimed by CNN and MSNBC and a bunch of other access media types that are just trying to get you loud and angry so you look bad and annoy people who are gonna vote for Biden later. <laughs> right. If, if you just, let that happen, then you're a pawn. Just, if you have to, take a break from the internet, <laughs> go do some thinking, read the Bible, read the founders, read the Constitution, um, and work to develop your own convictions about what is right and what is wrong. And then stand by those convictions, but st stand with humility. If you can be shown from one of these sources that you're wrong, be willing to modify your position. Um, humility is super important in these things. Um, but the important thing is don't be blown about by every wind of doctrine, by yes. every opinion of men, and don't just get pushed over here and pushed over here. Um, for all I know, everything that's been going on in this country the last couple months is one giant deception and distraction. And um, it's easy to get manipulated by the media to focus on the latest crisis. And, um, and I so, have news for you. I predict a couple more major crises before the election happens. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, you know, just got a feeling might happen. Yeah, I mean, there's no shortage of very real problems in the world, and you just have to divert attention to it for a few days to hype everyone up and then move them on to the next. So, so just focus on doing the right thing in every area of your life. You're, you know, you're not doing the right thing if you are completely absorbed by these crises and you completely abandon your family. You know, you have respons if you're married and you have kids, you have responsibilities to them. If you have an employer, you have responsibility to him you know, or her. Um, you have these additional responsibilities. Seek to execute every responsibility well and according to a right standard and a true standard. And that is what will give us the strength to actually overcome some of these systemic problems as we seek to do everything the right way. Yes. Well, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I know that this was not a, a fun gear episode, and I know that we didn't say all the things that you wanted us to say. But we focused on a bunch of the things that were important. We didn't even get to the French Revolution, though. I had a whole bunch of... You had a bunch of research. Well, I had a bunch of points, differences between the French and American revolutionaries. Uh, it still is worth looking at that because they happened at roughly the same time. They had roughly the same goals. Some of the same people participated in both. So it's very interesting to compare the two. And maybe we'll, we'll talk about that on a future live stream. You can always email us if you uh, want to request that one specifically. The, uh, uh, the email address is trextalk at trex-arms.com. Uh, you can send us questions. The next live is probably going to be um, more of our standard equipment um, related stuff, uh, unless a bunch more crises kick off. It could be that we're gonna continue to comment on the issues uh, of the day a bit more uh, as there tend to be more issues. So again, thank you for watching and we'll have another live stream at, uh, 4.30 p.m. Central Standard Time next Wednesday. We'll see you then. What are you reading? Um.
Someone was saying again and again to remove the sticker. 